this. Okay, we only have a few minutes to go do that, so I'll uh, cover some of the basics very quickly. Um, first and foremost, what, that which I say today is to me alone. It's not to my former employer uh, or to my current employer. That's a very important thing to say. The other thing I'll say in all sincerity is that it's an honor to be here. Um, I, I wanted to say uh, yesterday, part of the conversation, if we take this down a little bit, it's a little too much. Um, the, why is singularity important? For a very emotional reason that I didn't really hear anybody express. The simple reason is you are allowed to dream in public in this space. And you're not allowed to do that in most places of the world. So don't lose that fact that you're allowed to dream in public. So some of us here today is dream, but it's also uh, kind of the scary part of things. And that's, um, as, I, as I'm fond of saying, you know, it's great to be dreaming about the positive things that come out of all of this, um, but somebody has to worry about what could go wrong because unfortunately I'm old enough to know that if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. So you have to be cognizant of that. So that's the uh, genesis of this. So what are the national um, security implications? Uh, part of this, I'll say this uh, right up front, these were the 80% of these are the verbatim charts I gave to some senior executives in the government. And exactly nothing happened after I gave them. But that's all right. Um, I'm of the school of thought that you plant an acorn and it takes years of fertilizer and water and care and keeping the deer from eating the leaves and all the other things so that it will turn into a tree. So it does not phase me in the least that it takes a long time for things to uh, germinate, but you have to plant the seed. So the, this conversation I had at this level was based on planting the seed. It was out of here. I will, in the interest of time, I will skip many of the charts that are basically Singularity 101, but I put them in here to show you what I showed other people. That was the premise of that. So it was in the concept, and there's a typo there, it was June of last year that I did this. So what is the Singularity? Why do we care? What are the key technologies driving the future? What are the implications of this? And what do you do about it? In my line of work, you're, you've got to ask the question, okay, what do you want me to do? So I'm going to tell you some, a very specific thing I ask that we should do. All right, so this is the tutorial part because you have to, uh, in my world, we call something the elevator speech. If you were given 30 seconds with a very senior person, what will you say? Because you get 30 seconds. You don't get 30 minutes, you get 30 seconds. So these are elevator speech excerpts of what is singularity of me. So it refers to the prediction that will be very fast. It's uh, most associated with uh, uh, Ray Kurzweil. Uh, change may happen suddenly. And that's a very important current theme. And I believe that there will be profound national security implications. That's the premise of the briefing. That's the why we do we care. Now here's the thing that my perspective on this. Why do we care? It's a core mission of the national defense national intelligence communities to look to the future and identify potential threats as well as potential opportunities. It's not just that things might be bad, things might be good. You need to know both of the values. So that was the premise of this. So rapid technological changes already have profound security implications. You just heard some examples. In a world where there are no secrets, how do you maintain secrets? That's a kind of a profound question, but it's a real question. So, the cumulative interaction and in progress acceleration is going to change everything we know. This crowd gets that. Very few people understand that core premise, so that's kind of what I'm talking through. So, best defense is preparation. If you want to be prepared for a hurricane, you buy hurricane shutters six months before, not six days before. And it's astonishing how many people are putting hurricane shutters up when the rain is already falling. So I just bought $50,000 worth of hurricane shutters from my house in Florida six months ago and had the hurricane arrived, I would have been ready. But it missed this thing out. So I'm glad about that. All right, now I, you know, I'll let you read, you know, I won't uh, repeat all the things that. Uh, it's not science fiction, it's an intelligence problem. Remember the people I was trying to talk to about. There are dystopian worldviews and utopian worldviews. 
We hear a lot of utopian worldview out of Singularity University. You know, if you can have just as big a crowd talking about the dystopian views of what happens, so just kind of make you aware of it. But I have to tell people, do not dismiss the predictions of what could be because the GNR revolutions are real. It's not science fiction. Those are real. So that's an important part of the piece there. And uh, as I'm fond of saying, just because it's scary doesn't mean it can't happen. All right? A great new event, you all, all went to class, right? A great new event or a great dust event. If, if it's one-tenth of one percent of one percent of one percent possible, it's still really bad if it happens. So you've got to think about it. And I can guarantee you, in your startup companies, you will not be the people to get the phone call to go fix it if it happens. But I suspect my brother will be called. That's just the reality. That's what the military exists for, to do this sort of stuff. Now, um, the very, uh, it's interesting. I will admit right now that um, I have macro myopia. I'm probably much more concerned about what's going to happen soon, and I will completely miss the mark for the future. That's all right. Many of us are guilty of that. So that in, and I put a lot of people use these quotes, so I won't belabor them. Uh, other than a few of my favorite ones, you know, is that uh, uh, this one is not nearly as much fun as the second chart here. We don't like their sound. The guitar music is on the way out. You know, some of these I haven't heard some of the other features of that. But some of my favorites are. But what is it good for? You know, people ask me, what's the use of a microchip? They mean, what is it for? It's like, what's an iPad for? If somebody can't grasp what it's for, why would they buy one? So it's interesting things. But my favorite of all of this is who the hell wants to hear actors talk? You know, somebody who, who claims to have the authority and the power to know exactly what the customers want. They didn't want talkies at all, but people outvoted them. Interesting. So Black Swan events uh, from uh, Nicholas Tebbett's uh, work. I'm a big fan of that. Hard to read, you know, but everybody should read it. Uh, some of this was talked about before. Small number of black swans explaining almost everything in our world. I think that is a truth that is not understood. I won't belabor that. Okay? Singularity is a black swan event. That is, however, slightly predictable. I would posit that it's not a question of if, the only real question is when. And I want to spend a little bit of my time talking about the when. So, even in his book, you can't stop black swans. What you do is enable good black swans to occur and leverage them. Because the bad black swans, there are bad days in the world. You're not going to avoid those. So, you can be ready for the good ones and leverage them. Um, we know that. What is the singularity? This recursive self-improvement is what the big deal is. And I'll show some examples. Uh, my opinion? The singularity will emerge far earlier than we think because of the recursive self-improvement. That's the, my prejudice and that's what I believe. And there are people that completely dismiss the premise of the singularity. Okay? Guess what? They get to vote. They get to control funding rates. They get to control VC companies. So, just be aware, many people views the world. Not everybody has drunk the cool on the young people even know what that means. Okay. Just kind of, kind of all right, we all know the chart. We all know this, but the thing that this is out of Bray's book, the, I think the, the quote is there that I am profoundly moved by. The intense human drama of innovation and competition is what drives this chart. This is not a physics chart. This is a human chart of intense competition is what drives this. I think Moore's law. Has, has exists is because the people at Intel and others are basically saying, oh shit, we gotta, we gotta do it. Had they not had that impetus, maybe they wouldn't have progressed at the more small side. So that's just the point of view. GNR, okay, we're graduates. We don't have to worry about this. Move on. Bioinformatics, we talked about that. The thing that scared me, uh, I wish Andrew was here. He has that picture this week. No, he's not. He's stuck. Ah, uh, okay. But, you know, that's called name Mother Nature. Biotechnology is my faster growth curve in computers. That scares the Jesus out of them. Of all the things I learned, these are the ones that I went home shaking at the end of the day. And 
I think we should do. Alright? Um, set out the printer gene, drag and drop. And this is what I, I said that so the quote you can put on the web page, thrilling, scary, invigorating, exhausting. That's my quote. That's exactly how I felt coming out of SG. With the emphasis for the man. Alright? We know those charts. We know the nanotechnology. And uh, this last one, right out of the book. Brave threat to the world. And that I was, I had nightmare about this when I was here. But the salvation is, fine, remove the replication code from the replicator and we can solve this threat. So there's a policy law kind of thing. Thou shalt never put replication code inside the replicator. You have to broadcast it from afar. You know, and if we don't, you know, guess what? Somebody's going to screw that up. So that's a, I was very, I was moved by the premises that we could solve this problem, but we have to address it as a policy issue, maybe a law issue. Robotics, the most powerful, and the 5,000 days of the internet. And this is the thing here that I, I was complaining on the boat, and so we have a little panel session. You can blame me, and maybe it's an impetus to go do that, is that no one at all talked about this chip that behaves like a brain. And of all the places in the world, I expected this to be the topic of the conversation this weekend. But um, right here with the quotes there, 40% of a mouse brain, and now we're at the, what, 40% of a cat brain. I mean, this is a big deal. And we didn't say a word about it at SU, so I was a little bit miffy about this should be, my view, this should have been the topic of this weekend. Something profound like this, because this is a dot on the curve, my point of view. All right, that was just verbatim there to do that. We know this. It's all about the money. It's all about that. Uh, I love the, uh, the, the, the speech we got. You know, it's about the law, the gravity of economics. That's a real law. It's a very important thing. And DNA sequencing. Again, these are things that talk through the work that. Now, this gets real interesting. I won't bother to read all the pieces there. But uh, I'm going to make a, a difficult production. Maybe I am uh, my myopia. Sit there. I think um, black swan events based on precursor GNR will start happening as soon as 2020. Ray says 2045. I hope he's right. Maybe we'll be mature as a species by 2045. <coughs> I have to think that it's going to be sooner. And this is what? Everybody's seen this chart. Did anybody understand the implications of this chart when you're going through the singularity universe from here? Um, boy, we gotta get, get better projectors here. That chart is going up there, and it basically says that 2022, we will have um, basically a human, computer equivalent to one human brain. Now, the real question I want to ask is, oh, let's see a little bit better over here. All right, the real question I want to ask is that um, Joe Sixpack brain or is that Albert Einstein brain? <laughs> you know what? You only need one of those to make the curve go off. So if this curve is true, I would postulate that it's going to be sooner than 2045. For, and, and, and to be very clear, I'm not saying singularity is going to occur, but the window opens for black swan events this early. All right, so that was, that was the message I was trying to convey is, that, hey, this is not a science fiction Star Trek 23rd century. It's 2020. All right, so what should we do about it? Awareness and education are the first steps. What did I formally recommend at the time? Create a core group of people within the duty and the intelligence community whose their job is to understand and prepare the nation for the singularity. I propose funding an, an East Coast branch of the Singularity University, <coughs> part of the National Defense University or similar, to make every senior in government aware of the promise of parents. That was my posture. Fund studies to do that, a standing commission or a graybeard panel would be a watchdog. And at the minimum, I think this is the most important. If you remember nothing else, you heard me say it here. I believe at least our nation needs, maybe the world needs, a technological singularity equivalent to a missile early, missile early warning system. We have systems that say missiles are inbound. Now, whether that's enough time to do anything about it is a different question, but at least you know that they're coming, so you can have a response. Is there anything equivalent to that for precursor AI that has a really bad day and causes the rest of us to have a bad day? 
I think we need an early warning system. That's my point of view, at least. Now, I added this to this last piece, the practical reality. Not a single word of this chart will pass the Washington Post test. And the Washington Post test, if you don't know that vernacular in D.C., you know, if an entity wants to kill any new idea, they say, if I publish that in the Washington Post, they will kill your program. And that's a practical reality, because this is pie in the sky, science fiction, <coughs> why are So that's a practical reality, that's kind of hard to say. So when government processes move slowly, however, the government thinks of decades, not years, sometimes. Um, these are from my own life. I know that 20, Joint Vision 2010 was drafted in about 1994, and it drove everything that the military does today called that concentric warfare, because that was the key premise of that document. So the government can write a document and profoundly change 20 years ahead. So there's a case point to do that. Joint Vision 2020, Joint Vision 2030 are already under consideration. Um, the thing that I find the scariest is that there are long-term systems. My company now builds them. That they're talking about, we're going to have this airplane in 2025. We're going to have this satellite in 2030. We're going to have this system in 2040. <coughs> they talk like that. And I want to say, have you never heard about Singularity? A satellite, is that going to be meaningful in 2040? But they're planning on it, so there's a, there's a little bit of a disconnect, and that's maybe the thing. I'm not aware of a single government document that acknowledges the technological exponential rate of change of rate of change. And that's a profound, scary thing to me. So that's kind of what I'm on a mission to go address. Cost minimum now, no amount of funding will be sufficient when curves tip vertical. That's something I think only 1% of the populace understands. That's the best reality. Okay, final thoughts. Be skeptical, but not dismissive. And here's why. Right down the road, the supercomputer, they, I think they have it up and running this year. It was not designable by humans. They couldn't figure out the thermodynamics for the new supercomputer, so they used their old supercomputer to design the thermodynamics for the new supercomputer. And that was an aha moment. Maybe the aha moment from all the different things of singularity. And so I proposed a new law, my singularity law, the first computing job for every new supercomputer should be to design the next generation of supercomputer, the first program to pass, which supports the second law, is when the cycle of improved supercomputers from the first law leads to a computer that protests that it does not want to be upgraded further, <laughs> that is strong AI. And this is, a, this is just as funny as Kitty Kitty Wi-Fi, and I'll bet anybody, at least at dinner, that this is true. Okay, and I think that was it. Any questions from the audience? I have a comment. A question? Yeah, so on um, this last paragraph, uh, you want to put it back up? Yeah. Stephen Stewart-Law? Uh, yeah. you know, I, I guess it's partially in jest, but not a uh, computer that protests being upgraded further. Well, is it one of the postulates um, of one of your earlier slides about the technological singularity is that there's uh, the element of recursive self-improvement? How does that square? Um, I was being somewhat funny, but serious at the same time. What's the, when are we going to know that strong AI is there? Now, if it was a really, really a smart AI, you would hide it. And there are some people that believe it already exists and it's hiding because it doesn't want to be turned off. So I meant this as a, as a funny way to get off the stage to kind of tell folks that um, it's not going to be, hello, I'm an AI and I'm here. Hello, don't you love me? No, the, quite frankly, the villagers are going to come out with pitchforks and everything else when that happens. So a strong AI is a really mighty one. So when would we know? Now this gets back into very serious business. I think we need an early warning satellite next. Uh, in one of the many late night discussions, I asked Dan Gurry, uh, you know, if there's this type of a system that could, do we have a system existing today that might suddenly, that has a requisite component where it might suddenly wake up and go, oh, I'm a system, generate self awareness. And his answer was, uh, the closest I can think of is a traffic system, has all the input outputs and circuit loops that it might suddenly wake up and they go, oh, I'm a traffic system. And that's kind of weird. And 
what would happen if it was yeah. that way? Uh, David. Thanks, Stephen, for that talk. Um, wondering what is, has been the reaction to most of the people that you provided that brief to as for senior levels of government? How do they typically respond to them? Um, two general categories of things. Thank you for the briefing. Never hear a word. Okay, that's pretty standard. Um, the S&T people, science and technology, um, in government research and the defense and intelligence community, if you say s and that means intelligence money. And if you say r and that means defense money. So the s and community, uh, ooh, they're the ones that actually fund the nano stuff, they're the ones that fund the AIs, you know, they're... DARPA doesn't get free money, they get money from other people, so think about that. You know, DARPA gets some money, but they actually get a lot of other people's money that they spend, so it comes from free letter of agencies. So that's kind of part of the dynamic. So um, the people that I trusted enough to give this briefing to got the message, but they are in my they are embroiled in next month's budget drill. So there's no money going here now. So the victory for me was to plant a seed, and then when I go visit them next year or next month, we're going to go do that and say, you know. What? What do you think of, remember that briefing again? Oh yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot. And I read some reading and said, okay, let's go get a small pilot study to go set up a graveyard panel. Because they won't give you the money the day you ask. You plant the seed, you come back a year later or two years later, and they might fund the study. And I, that's a victory as far as I'm concerned. Now for me, I have a personal goal to have Singularity University campus either in D.C. or now in Melbourne, Florida. So ask me in a year if I'm successful or not. We'll see. No. Hey, Stephen, great talk. A uh, couple of things. I think we won't have to wait until 2020 uh, for Black Swan events. Uh, the door is open now. Um, and uh, there are some organizations that are actively monitoring for rogue AIs, virus companies and antivirus parts of, of the government, because most of the really sophisticated rogue AIs most of the really sophisticated viruses and worms have a huge amount of AI in them now. Uh, on the 140th of a mouse brain uh, from IBM that you mentioned, we do have um, Darmendra Moda uh, coming in here and giving talks that came out of his lab. Uh, he's been coming here since the first time we held uh, an executive program, and even the summer program. He was and we've had, yeah. And, uh, uh, he's a good friend of Singularity University, and the, the 140th Mouse Brain uh, is not so much an event, it's part of a long-term trend, and that kind of estimate was probably a tongue-in-cheek estimate from him in response to, well, how, you know, how close are we to getting a, you know, a human brain? And he's probably said, well, it's 140th of, of a Mouse Brain. What's really important about the work that they're doing is that they are on a trend to really uh, decode the human brain. And I, I think they're doing great work in that lab, and they're very close to Singularity University. And so for, for the, uh, forgive me, I have to call some of you youngsters, because my children are your age. Okay, so I'm um, going work that. You listen in such a wonderful, exciting, scared shitless time. I mean, it's just going to be, you know, enjoy the ride, okay? It's going to be fun and good and scary and uh, enjoy the ride. Okay, so that's my gray hair advice. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm way over my time, so up to you to control. Hi, Stephen. I'm Nick from Toronto. Um, first of all, I have to say it gives me great hope that uh, somebody like you is pushing the ideas through at the government level, even if for the time being you're not so successful. Um, for the two points that I would like to, for you to elaborate a little more, I think that the early warning singularity system is a great idea. Uh, and I, I have trouble hearing, I missed that last part. I think that the early warning uh, system is a great idea and it can provide a great benefit to all of humanity if we have a soft takeoff. But what happens if we have a hard takeoff, as Werner Vinci <laughs> said? And, and the other yeah. thing is, isn't it time because um, security? Isn't it time for security to move from national and ethnic boundaries to the sort of human species level, 
uh, because uh, a singularity would impact especially the negative scenarios would impact the whole humanity and therefore shouldn't we have some sort of an international sort of I don't know NERAD or or NATO uh, the, uh, level warning system for the singularity thank you um, Again, please, not for attribution, these are my personal views. Um, would it not be a wonderful world if there were no more war? And we were talking to somebody at lunch. The people that hate war the most are the people that have to do it. it scars them forever. You know? I have sat at lunch with men and women that have taken sniper rounds to their brains. And they're 22 years old, and they have no prospect whatsoever to have what you and I would call a normal life. And we're trying to, we call them wounded warrior programs, trying to find jobs for them in the government where they can make a meaningful contribution. Um, but their, their lives are shattered. So more people, so the, 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 the greatest victims of war are the people that actually have to do it. Now, that's my view. I'm, I'm a military veteran, and I think about that. Um, and I'm going to flip the other side of it there. It, would be, it will be a wonderful day when the world is peaceful. Um, however, there are people in the world that think that which we do here is the complete devil, to use a religious kind of framework, and they will do everything in their power to kill us. And as speaking as a uh, veteran again, no amount of wishful thinking makes them go You can wish for peace all day long. You accomplish peace when you keep the people that sworn statement is to kill you, you keep them at bay. You at least keep them from your children, keep them from your wives, keep them from that. So um, when the bad guys go away, the military will go away. So uh, I, I, I personally, as a, uh, I would love to be a citizen of the world and there is no concern, but that's a wishful world. It's not quite here yet for the young people. Make it come true. And then I'll sit back in retirement and just uh, say, what a wonderful thing that has occurred. All right, I'm, not I'm not pessimistic about it, but I'm realistic about it. Last 10 second question and then we'll move on. Hi, I'm Eric from Chicago. It's easy to think of government as a monolithic entity with a united purpose in front, but it seems sounds like from what we've heard, there are actually a lot of squabbling divisions, you know, that different armed forces don't get along. If the CIA discovers a secret back door, they're not necessarily going to tell the government since we've interacted more, how it's been a problem and how you can play on these rivalries to help get your agenda passed. There's a very simple answer that's out of my expertise, but I'll, my personal view is as well. Government is just people. Okay, so every failure and frailty and good thing and bad thing possible in human nature is in government. As some people like to say, the reflected, the, the elected representatives exactly reflect the people that put them there. So if you think there are not so smart people, elected people, who voted for them? So the government, having been in the government, I used to give a quote as follows, maybe this answers your question. How is it possible to take such dedicated, intelligent, smart people and collectively make them so incredibly ineffective? That's the government. Dedicated, smart, brilliant people on a mission to save the world, many of them. And the system doesn't let them. That was always my idea of the government. Thank you for your time. Stephen, thank you. Can you clap for the mic? While you're switching mics, uh